as far as I am concerned, Hayabusa, Tanaka, and the rest of that crew can't wear these people's shoes. They're too big for these so-called athletes. And I say not so-called because of their strength. I say so-called because of their heart. When you have a sin sin with no guts and the heart of a chicken, you produce wrestlers that have no guts and hearts of chickens. Now you have got the funk masters of wrestling that are all heart, all guts, and we're not taking a backseat to anyone. No, never, never, never. Welcome to a very special edition of Pro Wrestling Radio. You heard him in the beginning, and he is our guest for the entire hour. So let's not waste any time. He is the author of the autobiography, Terry Funk, More Than Just Hardcore. He is a former ECW and NWA World Heavyweight Champion, a true legend in the business, and most importantly, I have had the honor of calling some of this man's great matches. He is Terry Funk. Terry, welcome back to the show. Well, it's great being back again. Uh, last show that we were on, I thought it was a dang good one, you know. Oh, I, had I was a just bl- wondering who that guy that was uh, at the front of that uh, promo right there, who was that guy hollering and screaming? That guy could talk. <laughs> <laughs> who was that crazy masked man? I don't know. That boy was wild, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my producer looked at me and said, is that your guest? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, what, you know, off the bat, what do you remember about doing that Funk Masters of Wrestling deal? It sounded like a lot of fun. It it really was, you know, uh, and the reason I went with Funk Masters of Wrestling, if you think about it, see, is I could play right off of the FMW, mm-hmm. see, and uh, Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling is what it was. Right. So that's FMW, so I played off of the same letters of it, FMW, is Funk Masters of Wrestling, and it, uh, it worked wonderful, it worked great. It was really a hot item over there in Japan, and uh, did big business with it, you know, we did... Uh, 45,000 people for a for a match over there without any television. Wow. You know, 40 40,000, I don't know if it was 45, 38, 45, 42, whatever they said it was, but it was a hell of a crowd, you know, it was uh pretty much a, a full stadium. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, a, an obvious question to start off with these days is how are you feeling? Uh feeling absolutely um I'm not going to say great. Yeah. Uh, I'd be lying to you. <laughs> I'm feeling much, much better than what I was and uh, doing better day by day, and it just takes a little bit of time, you know, uh, come off of all that different stuff that I came off of. And uh, uh, you also have to uh, get your confidence back, too, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, before you have to believe that you're you're feeling good before you can feel good. Sure. Sure. Speaking of professional confidence, when when you were in WCW the last time, and you write a lot about this in your book, uh, and, and the way they used you as compared to the way that you've been used in other places throughout your career, did it did it hurt your confidence? Did you ever question your confidence at all during that time? Not my confidence. Uh, I just questioned my sanity. <laughs> but uh, I also questioned their sanity at the time. You know. Yeah. I just thought I had a great deal uh, to offer to them, and. Uh, Whenever I got there, evidently it was somebody up the up in the hierarchy that uh, wanted me, but the people immediately, uh, my superiors, uh, weren't sure whether they needed me or not. Right, right. You know, they certainly didn't uh, uh, loosen the reins and let me take off running. 
No, no. I... Well, and I don't blame them. It's their business. Sure. You know? Sure. But I try not to... Uh, I try never to hurt a territory. You know, I love coming into territory and popping it. That was one of the great things. Uh, going down to Florida, you know, or, or, or to any place, you know, and going in and... Uh, and actually increasing their attendance, and then whenever I leave, is to leave that attendance where it is, if not better. Do you do you think that you have more of an appreciation for that, uh, the way that you were brought up with uh, with your own territory and, and what your father's territory? Oh, absolutely. Uh, because, you know, if you want to go back, it's just the way that you were bought, brought into the business and the way that you uh, were brought up. And, and I was brought up in the business, and I was brought up around wrestlers. And I knew the guys that uh, um, were not making a real good living, but they were making a living. Right. And I knew the stars, too, you know, and I knew how they tried to help each other. And I watched them, you know, and I watched my dad was concerned about guys that uh, uh, weren't the greatest in the ring, but that were his friends, and he wanted to see them make a de decent living yeah. in, in the profession and be able to continue it and uh, enjoy life the way that they want to and um, that's the same thing with me is uh, I, I, you know I, I wish I could help more than what I do now you know I wish I was younger and uh, in my prime and and could go to some different places and possibly pop up with a, a new organization and give it a total 100% of all which I do give but with all of my time I don't because yeah. I can't give all of my time used to is we'd wrestle seven nights a week and uh now we we can't do that you know i, I can't do it physically speaking i'm uh I'm fortunate to get in there you know once a week or once every other week i really prefer and uh once a year you know as i keep on uh burying the business in my backyard but i keep on digging it up you know <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely you know I, I and and speaking speaking of what you're saying i don't think people realize unless they were actually there i, I was lucky enough to be there in, in ecw as, as a ring announcer and then you know weaseling my way into the locker rooms you know for a couple years before that isn't that wonderful to have to weasel your way and not be just accepted into there <laughs> it really is and i mean when you make it you really appreciate it don't you oh absolutely absolutely it's it's so different than it is today it's just so it, it, it is and what i was going to say was that I don't think people realize the importance of having a veteran like yourself, of your stature in a a, a, um, a blossoming company like that, and the kind of asset that somebody like yourself would be to a new company, just to kind of bring the reins in a little bit. Well, you know, as um, I often talk about this, about what is a leader and everything else, you know, and and my favorite leader of all time and in, uh, in uh, professional athletics was John Ayers of the San Francisco 49ers. He was a offensive guard for him. He was a great player. Uh, he and Randy Cross were the guards for him at the time. Joe Montana was the quarterback and they just won two Super Bowls back to back and John Ayers was a leader of that team but it was really funny because John Ayers uh, and Joe Montana will tell you that today if you ask him is that John Ayers was a leader. He later passed away with cancer at 44 and I'm the godfather of his children but John Ayers was a great great man and the reason he was such a good man because he'd come back to the sideline when he was on the sideline and he wouldn't sit next to coach and by golly he'd sit down on the end of that bench mm. and by golly he'd sit there and then he'd go back in whenever it came his time and he'd do his job Yeah. and John Ayers didn't he wasn't the guy that said let's go attack or let's go do this or that he did it by his actions and not by his words and that's why everybody loved him so much he's a very quiet man yeah. and i you know i'll never be the man that he is or was but i would you know i would really like to be that kind of person and uh you know, somebody asks me a question, I'll answer it in the dressing room. You know, if they ask me to watch their match, I'll watch it. If they ask me to uh, critique something, I'll critique the whole show for them. But you know, I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, it's 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 the way I think a person should do it, and lead by his actions, and try to 
try to give people a hundred percent when you go into that ring so the others can see that yeah and, and, and try to do it for your fellow wrestler and not for the payoff yeah i'm not taking anything away from anybody else but the last um the last pair of shows that, that i was down for uh for mlw you were in on the second night and the first night uh you weren't in and you could just tell just a difference in the locker room by having a presence just the presence alone of somebody like yourself and this takes nothing away from the other guys there it, it's well i don't know if i've got that kind of a presence maybe maybe something else happened in the locker room that we didn't <laughs> know about or something that gave that presence because i don't know if i got that kind of presence but I sure do love those boys. Wow. I love all the young guys in business. Yeah. Does it bother you sometimes when you see um, some of your uh, some of your peers for, from your day or maybe a couple years after, and they come into a dressing room and they just have their nose up in the air and, and don't want to talk to anybody and just kind of collect their money and go home? You know, I, my wife and I were talking about that just like last night, you know, and it just amazes me that... Uh, that those people that do that sometimes surpass all the others mm -hmm. and they totally expect to be treated like that yeah and they just don't understand they just don't understand it's it's a guy that they are dancing with that makes them and even even a guy that that they are dancing with if he couldn't hold up his Two two or tights or whatever you want to call them. Well, if he couldn't even hold up his tights, you can't you can't do it by yourself in a ring. You know, you can say you can dance with a broomstick, but brother, it uh, it better be a short dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll t I'll tell a story here that um that that there was a pair of MLW shows and um you know and, and you were in town uh, doing those shows and so was Jerry Lawler. And I guess he just wasn't having a good night, and he really wasn't talking to anybody and kind of keeping to himself. And you took it upon yourself to go over there and pretty much told him to lighten up a little bit. Well, I don't know if I told him to lighten up. I don't, I don't think I ever told Jerry to lighten up. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing about Jerry is I just love him, you know. Yeah. And uh, I've never seen, you know, I've never seen Jerry go into a ring and not perform. He can be in any attitude that he is. But uh, he's one of those guys, too, that are just great performers, you know. And uh, a lot of guys ask you. And, and then again, you know, who's the great workers in the business, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes it's, it's kind of... And I got to thinking about that. And, you know, that dad gum, Dusty Rhodes, is pretty great because he was able to make a lot of money a lot of years. Sure. You know, and without without a whole lot of effort. Well, he was doing something right. <laughs> but I'll be darned if he, you know, and, and it's the truth, you know. What's the greatest? Uh, maybe that the most money is the one that makes the most money. The greatest worker is the one, you know, uh, possibly he is. Yeah. You know, possibly he is because he's working with that promoter, too. Yeah. And he's working with the people and everyone else. But, uh, I don't like to think of things that way, but uh, possibly it's true, you know. And uh, a lot of those, a lot of those, you know, the squeaky wheels. Mm -hmm. They certainly got the grease at WCW, did they? <laughs> they sure did. And again, we are talking to Terry Funk. He is the author of the autobiography, newly released, more than just hardcore. And speaking of Lawler, you went down to Memphis uh, last year, and and I'm not just saying this because you're on the show, because I was saying this um, at the time, that that was some of the gr the best TV, the promos that you sent in and the angle where you came out of the coffin uh, on TV. Are you going to be going down there and doing anything else? Because you guys had a, a heck of a house down there. Well, Corey Max has been calling me back up, you know, and uh, uh, he wanted me to come down there and uh, go one more round with Lawler, and it's and and I promise you that I'm 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 shooting you straight right now, because mm -hmm. that uh, um, that ECW show's coming up with Shane Douglas, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that's going to take a lot out of me. Yeah, and and it, and it really is, and 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 I truly, and and a lot of you fans think I'm nuts and say, oh well, he's retired. I have. But I've gone out there and I buried wrestling in the backyard, dug a hole for it, put it down in there, and I forever find myself going back out there and digging it up for mm. my love of the business. Yeah. And I continue to do that. And again, this time, you know, I'm not, God, don't quote me as I'm going to quit the business. Uh, 
uh, certainly if somebody offered me $5 million to, to do one more moonsault, I probably would do it. You know? <laughs> uh, or maybe a double moonsault and disappear up my butt or whatever, you know. But, uh, Dad, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a business that, uh, I just, I just love it and, uh, I want to continue on in it. And I, and like I said, as I, I keep on going back there and I keep on going back to it, you know, and, and again, as, as Corey Mack is concerning him, as, uh, Dad Gummit, he wants me to come down there and commit to a date. And right now, I'm not trying to commit to any dates because mm-hmm. I'm just tired and, and, uh, just thinking about, Doing one last real good one up there at ECW. Yeah, and, and I really want to, and and I could have gone either place, you know, and I, I picked the one. Yeah, so, so I better be good in the one. <laughs> so you're not going to be involved in the WWE one? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, they sent me a contract, and it was a. Uh, be very von- honest with you, it was a much more lucrative contract. Mm-hmm. I could have done them both. I could do, uh, uh, but uh, again, I want to perform at my best and I don't want to perform it like a fool at my age and I want to perform at my best and I feel I can only do one of those shows and perform greatly in a weekend Yeah. and so I picked the one closest to my heart and that is the uh, Shane Douglas show because I feel that that is the ECW fans Yeah. Um, I feel that the other fans at the other show are going to be wannabe ECW fans they're going to be make-believe ECW fans. They're not going to be real ECW fans at Vince's show. The real group, even though you might want to believe that they are, they aren't. The real ECW fans are going to be in Philadelphia at Shane Douglas's show. Yeah. And now, now, what do you remember about, and I don't know if you remember much about and it. And the but- money was uh, quadruple or triple of what Shane Douglas is going to pay me, and uh, that show is going to pay me. And, uh, by golly, I just want to still show the fella that there's, you know, is, is, it's a true thing. You need competition mm-hmm. in the wrestling business. And, uh, Vince certainly has, you know, and, and if you don't have competition, it's a proven fact that businesses die. And it might be true about people, too, you know. So what I want to do is I want to beat competition to Vince and, Keep that on recuss alive a few more years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you remember about the first three way dance that you guys did? Because really, and I was there, and um, and, and a lot of a lot of people say they were there, but but uh, but uh, you know, and they weren't. But they've seen it on videotape, and it really did change the face of ECW. It just brought the matches to a new level. What do you remember about the very first three way dance that you and Sabu and Shane did? Well, it was very creative. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, uh, the whole thing, uh, was a, was a new situation. It was a new look to wrestling. Yeah. It really was. And it, it brought wrestling into the present state of the, uh, of the put your butt on the line state of, uh, 100% in that ring state. Right. And, uh, that's what you have to do. And it, it kind of, Establish that, yeah. And it established because we went so long, and we wrestled so hard. It, it, it established a a a level or a bar that needed to be reached before things were accepted. Yeah, yeah. And, and it really was. Uh, it, it really did. Um, you know, set the wheels in motion of the next stage for ECW, which was such a great thing. It was such a creative match, too. Yeah. It really was. You know, it was 60 minutes of, uh, of, of a whole lot of creativity that was going on just mentally that was uh, uh, taking place within the ring itself um, among three guys. And, uh, and uh, it was a wonderful, and, you know, I hate to use the word again, but it was a wonderful uh, gum and very hard to duplicate and that's what really scares me yeah because we're coming up with uh sabu and i and shane here i am as uh i'm a real old toot right now and uh shane is not as young as he used to be (laughs) and sabu he's been through 
a lot of uh, physical trials and, and uh, dad gummit I, I just hope that we can produce what they want yep. and I think that we're going to give it heck excellent excellent well listen uh, we're going to take a, a quick break and uh, I'm going to ask if you can hang on through the break you bet all right excellent we are talking to the legendary Terry Funk he is the author of the brand new autobiography <laughs> Terry Funk more than just hardcore and when we come back we'll try and cover as much of this man's great and lengthy and legendary career as we possibly can before one o'clock you're listening to the radio show in two places one on the internet through my website prowrestlingradio.com wbcb 1490.com it'll be air wbcb 1490 a.m. take off the robe and show them your back they'll turn around This is ridiculous. This is embarrassing, Terry. You're talking about the world champion of the NWA. Hey, I want to tell you kids something. Don't believe in Santa Claus. And remember, old Yeller ain't no dog. And now, back to more pro wrestling radio. I'm your host of the show, All righty, we are back, and we are joined by the legendary... Terry Funk and Terry, it seems like that that interview alone from your series with Ric Flair has taken on a whole life of its own these days. T Terry, are, are you there? I didn't know that was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> it's like a walk down memory lane. You know, I love it when I have the legends on the show and I pick some random stuff out from their career. And most of the time, like, like I had Dusty on two weeks ago and I played an interview from 84 and he just sat there silent for about 10 seconds and he said, you know what, I am humbled just listening to that. And I think that's really cool when I... Oh. <laughs> yeah, Dad Gum Dusty's humble. He's a, he's amazed. He thought that he was he thought he was uh, uh maybe he thought he was uh some heavenly body speaking that he heard there. That's right. He was humbled by himself. That, that sounds very much like the dream. He gets so humbled in his American dream and he says he says a heartbeat of America. He says, My little baby was on my chip and I said, Honey, what do you hear? And she says, I hear the heartbeat of America. <laughs> that is tremendous. You, you know what's great about about both your books? You guys both have the same Dr. Jerry Graham story in your but books. But they're different versions. Yeah. But, but they're truthful. <laughs> it's just, you know, Ray Stevens used to always tell me that, and I said it in the book, too. Ray Stevens always said, if it's good enough to tell, it's good enough to color up a little bit. <laughs> you know, but... But honestly, I don't know. I haven't read his version. Yeah, it's it's slightly. I'm sure he's read my version though. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm not going to read that fat egg sucking dog's book. <laughs> <laughs> that dramatic fight. Uh, and the beginning of his wrestling career is a lot different than the way you describe it in your book. Oh, his, his wrestling career. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, which one do you believe? <laughs> you know, Dusty, but I'll tell you one thing about the dream, Mo, is he is the American dream. Yeah. And that's one wonderful thing, too, about our business, you know. And that's the one great thing that I discuss in the book. You know, one of the good things, not great, one of the good things that I discuss is that uh, um, for years we were extensions of our own personalities. Yeah. And uh, uh, we were, we were, th that was our character. And Dusty Rhodes is the American dream. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, uh, but Vince wanted to go a different route and do the dialogue and all of this. And it's, uh, I like wrestling the way it was. And I think that's why there's such a great resurgence in the 70s and 80s, you know, as I go to, Carolinas and wrestle for Tony Hunter and he draws like crazy, you know. That's what I hear. I hear the crowds yeah. on there are tremendous. Yeah. And, they, and, and, they Go over there, and the crowds that Harley have are just so respective and wonderful over there, you know. And he does a great, great business too, you know. But it's uh, it's wrestling the way it was. It's not how it is. It's the way it was. Yeah. And uh, who knows where we're headed, you know? Yeah. It, it, it's really, it's really, 
it's really becoming very difficult to predict right now. Wow. And, 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 and we're talking to a guy that everybody says predicted WrestleMania years, years ahead of its time. Well, by golly, I'm getting more, you know, as I just love it. If I make enough predictions, you know, the, they forget the bad ones and keep the good ones. <laughs> you, know, and I, you know, they forget about the mistakes. <laughs> like Chainsaw Charlie. Right. <laughs> and Doctor Knows It All. That was a good one. I never heard of that one until I read it in your truth. book. That, that's honestly the truth. It sounds so stupid yeah. that it sounds like a big lie, but it's not. You can... Find Joe Blanchard, he's in the San Antonio phone book, and call him up and ask him if I wasn't Dr. Knows It All for one week on his TV. <laughs> uh, you know, do you, do you think that's a big misconception? Because a lot of people remember, um, you know, when you, when you came in doing the Chainsaw Charlie thing, everybody at the time was, was saying, all the hardcore fans were saying, I can't believe they're doing that to Terry Funk. I think I even said that to you when I ran yeah, into you. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't Vance. Yeah. It was me. <laughs> I'm not a fond lover of the man either. Right. But uh, I'll be honest, you know, mm -hmm. I I don't want him to get credit for creating that fiasco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, talking a little bit about 1989, um, you know, you write a lot in your book about um, how, how it came about that you wound up, in, you know, in the retirement match and then doing commentary and all that good stuff. And we talked about it actually the last time you were on the air here. But what I thought was interesting that I just heard an interview with Ric Flair that was conducted a couple of years ago, but I just heard it and a caller on the radio show brought it up and they said, why, why did you do it? And he said, it wasn't me. It was Jim Ross and Jim Hurd and I had nothing to do with it. Well, see, as he knew it was there. Right. See, and that's, uh, uh, was that, uh, you know, I mean, and, and by golly, I don't, I don't, I don't care. That's water under the bridge. Yeah. You know, but I mean, it happened, and uh, and I never, uh, I never said it was because of this one person. Right. Um, I just figured, you know, as uh, I just, you know, I knew that it had happened. I knew that it uh, took place, and uh, I, you know, you assume that it's the whole committee. Yeah. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Now, at the time, you were uh, arguably the hottest heel in the business in 89, and I remember um, going to the shows, going to a couple of the bad shows, and it was just something that you don't see today. I mean, when you would, when you would go after people, they would run. You know, they were that, they were that scared of you. Uh, after you, were, you were, were winding down that angle and they wanted to push you into the commentary role, was there any thought to jumping over to Vince at the time since you were so hot? Not not really yeah not really um you'll 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 find me you know as uh uh at that time i was very happy um uh, with the situation down there you know i mean the money was great mm -hmm. uh wouldn't happen with with the behind the scenes politics of it yeah but uh i was somewhat happy with the uh scheduling and, and you know i mean it was hard work but it uh it's awful tough on me to go to New York because of geography, you know, and it's a it's a long way from here. Right. You know, and that sounds rather silly, but uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the same thing over and over again, and I don't care who it's for or what, you know. As I've always been my own boss, and I love being my own boss, and I'm a bit of a Bolshevik, <laughs> and I like to go out and earn a bunch of money in as quick a time and as short a time as I can and come back home and enjoy life and be thankful for the people that uh, uh, came to the arenas. Uh, whether to boo me or cheer me, it didn't matter. They, they paid admission to see me and uh, thankful for them. And uh, Dad Gummett and on down the road to Funker goes with as hmm. few dates as I can make in a year so I can be at home with my family and, and be home on the place that I love. Yeah, and uh, if you're from New York, uh, think about it a little bit. You know, if, if that's home, it'd be a pretty good place to stay too. But it's not my home. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, I had on occasion uh, the honor of uh, of sitting in a production meeting with Gary Hart, who you talk a lot about in the book. And Gary's just tremendous. And Gary was telling a story um, during the meeting. He was telling all kinds of stories, but he was telling us a story about the aftermath from the infamous bag angle that you guys did in 89. Can you can you kind of recap that, what happened afterwards? Oh, gosh, afterwards it's just chaos. I mean, they, they uh, 
uh, they came to us, and it was it's, it was so absurd. It was such a small thing, you know, and I mean, it really was, but I mean, it just for some reason, you know, I mean, here you look at the violence that we have on TV today and the violence that's in the movie screens and what we depict on the news shows and everything else, and what, what I did is just... <laughs> Hold a plastic bag over his head there. The people went insane all the way across the United States. <laughs> and they, had to, they had to jerk the show, you know, and they couldn't. <laughs> for one reason, I, but that was, uh, I guess it was just, oh, my God. But then again, see, as you have to remember at the, uh, the suspension of disbelief. Yeah. And see, back then you could suspend disbelief. Yeah. Now it's very difficult. I think, if I remember right, I think he was telling me the story, and he said that they called you guys into an office, and they said whose idea was it, and you said it was his idea. That's right. It was. <laughs> <laughs> but very, Gary Hart's very proud of that, though. If I try to claim that now, he'd get mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the reaction been to the book among the fans and among your, your peers? Uh, it's going very well. They're uh, going through two editions now, and... Uh, hopefully going to start a third one mm -hmm. and it's uh, uh it, it's a very good response uh, hopefully it picks up on its own you know as i'm not jane fonda i can't get on good morning america and go ahead and cry the blues and say i'm sorry i went you know i'm <laughs> sorry i went and dressed up like a Viet Cong over there and then uh went running around with them and shed some tears and then sell a million books. It doesn't work that way. Maybe you could go on TV and cry about putting a bag over Ric Flair's head and, and you'll sell a million books, right? Well, if I could, I'd darn sure try to get on. <laughs> <laughs> but what the deal is, though, is uh, it's much more difficult than that for me because it's hard work. Yeah. And a lot harder work than I thought it was. You know, as uh, uh, writing a book was a piece of cake. It was great, you know, and dealing with Scott Williams, who's a great person and a good writer, too. But... Uh, uh, it's a whole lot different with with that was the easy part the hard part is getting it out there and letting people know and just like your show right here yeah. uh, I'll bet I've done uh, and it's no exaggeration as I bet I've done over 200 shows Wow you know radio and here and there and going here and book signings and this and that and uh, seems like I'm gonna continue on you know but it it sure makes you think that government uh, funk, are you doing the right thing here? Huh? <laughs> you know, hopefully I am, and I think I am. Yeah. You know, uh, it, I, I really, I really wanted to tell the story because sometimes we have a need to tell a story. Our story needs to be told. Yeah. And I tried to tell that story, the story of, of wrestling for the past 40 years in that book and how it's changed and uh, somewhat of, uh, of, of how it's evolved from my father's time to now. And uh, I really felt the need to do that and uh, did it. And I, I think it's a decent job of it, too. I know that uh, uh, without Scott Williams, I couldn't have done it because he's such a wrestling historian and I can go back and I can say yeah and I was in Atlanta and that gum and then I went from Atlanta to Vancouver and Vancouver to Houston I can remember where I went but I'll be dad gummed if I can remember the year mm. you know what I mean right right or, or you know uh, and, 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 and the date yeah and he can he can look up at uh you know, I can remember the time that Wahoo and I wrestled, you know, and, and he knows it. And, and that's what takes that tremendous time off of the writing of the book. You yeah. know, I mean, that book would have taken me a couple of years to write. Yeah. And uh, we whipped it out pretty doggone fast, and it was because of his knowledge of wrestling and his wonderful mind for the business and dates and the history in the business.
Good, good. And before before I go to my uh, second and uh, final break, um, I, I have to ask you. Um, you know, you talk a little bit about Bruno Sammartino in your book, and I have Bruno Sammartino on the show next week, and he's actually a pretty free, frequent guest on the show, and I've gotten to know him a little bit since having him here, and I I think the world of him. But I think what's what's really odd is over the last couple of years, guys like Dusty and Hogan and Flair have put out these books and taken shots at Bruno. And well, I'll have, they, you know, I mean, I, I I love Bruno. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you, there is a very, very honorable man. There is a guy that uh, certainly protected his profession more than, and I don't mean this bad whenever I say it. I'm not knocking Dusty. Mm-hmm. That certainly protected his profession more than Dusty. Mm-hmm. Certainly protected his profession more than Ric Flair. Certainly protected his profession more than Hulk Hogan. But also, he certainly protected his profession more than Terry Funk. Mm. And I think that that's a wonderful trait. And I think that he's uh, one hell of a man. And gosh, I, I, I really mean that. He's just, he's just I've, I've always admired him to no end, you know? Yeah. Is he had an opportunity, doggone near split up with uh, Vince McMahon Sr. Because uh, Shohei Baba, he met him over, you know, he met him. And by golly, whenever Bruno says, you know, and they became friends, and whenever they become friends, you become Bruno's friends, well, he'll never let you down. He'll never forget that, you know. And uh, uh, Vince Sr. went with Anoki. Bruno says, I'm not going to do that. He went with them in New Japan. And uh, Bruno says, I'm not going to do that. Bob is my friend. And he went with the threat of Vince McMahon Sr. going ahead and and uh, uh, destroying his career. Yeah. Uh, if he took the belt from him, that would destroy his career. But he went with that threat. He went right over there to, to all Japan, which was Shoei Baba's company, and wrestled for him. Because Baba was his friend, and he would not in any way or form do anything to hurt him. And I know for a fact he went over there for a pittance of what he would, uh, what he could have gotten. And, uh, just expenses because he wanted to help the guy out because he was his friend. So, how can you knock a guy like that? Right. Right, absolutely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking with Terry Funk. Terry, we're going to head to our last break. Uh, we'll bring we'll bring back some memories. We come back from the break, so keep your ears open, and uh, we'll bring you right back. All right, we are talking to Terry Funk. He is the author of the autobiography, Terry Funk, More Than Just Hardcore. And you're listening to the radio show in two places. One on the internet through my website, prowrestlingradio.com, wbcb1490.com. It'll be there, wbcb1490 AM. Today, I have paid the price. How do you plan to do it? How are you going to beat this? How do I plan to do it? The man is invincible. How can you say he's invincible? Nobody's going to know. How many years has that man been wrestling professional compared to myself? What family does he come from? Who did? Where did he come from in the wrestling world? From some rock band or something? Do you realize that I started wrestling when I was five years old? I wrestled amateur all the way through high school. Uh, I wrestled amateur okay. all the way through college. Okay. My father okay. was a professional okay. wrestler. You're gonna My brand brother that was thing. a professional You're gonna brand wrestler. With this and thing. I am going to keep the family name going. Oh, yeah. okay. Am I going to yeah. brand him? Yeah. I might just brand and you here on television. You don't intimidate me. I don't intimidate you. How would you like for us to turn you around right. and pants like you that. right here on television and brand you right here? Do you realize that I want to be treated with respect? I want to be treated with respect. You are talking to the next WWE. Let's see what this man does in the ring. Come on, baby. The man's... Yeah. Back to more pro wrestling radio. I'm your host of the show, All righty, thank you very much. Let's bring back Terry Funk and Terry. Uh, uh, I am so good, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> have you humbled yourself like that? Uh, I, am, I am so humbled right now. I'm just getting more and more humbled at each moment that I hear from the past. <laughs> what really P.O.'s me is I. 
dang, I'd like to be able to do promos like that again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to throw out there for you that you're going to be uh, signing books up by my neck of the woods at Borders Express at the Montgomery Bowl Mall in North Wales, Pennsylvania. I have you listed here Saturday, June 11th, the day after Shane Douglas' ECW show from 1 to 3 p.m. So for the local fans in the area, uh, you can go up there, say hello to Terry, and get your books autographed, buy some more books, and uh, I'm sure you'd love seeing all the fans in Philly. Well, I sure would. I'm I'm looking forward to it, seeing the Philly fans. I want to tell you one thing, though. Okay. I want to tell you very seriously right now. Okay. You know, the WW the the show that Vince is putting out. Mm-hmm. It can look like ECW. It can smell like ECW. It can have ECW performers. But it's not ECW, and don't forget it. It's Vince McMahon. Yeah, yeah. Now, you can come over here, or you can go there, and you can be a pretend ECW fan, or you can come to the ECW show, and you can see a three-way dance. Yeah. And I'll tell you one thing. I am there because I want to be there. I had a choice and I picked what I wanted to do because that is what is in my heart. And I don't want to see Vince McMahon just like he did with the rise and fall of ECW. Oh, his ratings went down a bit. So what does he do? He puts out a video on the rise and fall of ECW. Yeah. And he goes ahead and puts that out. And Paul Heyman, who's supposed to be the creator and everything else, Paul Heyman evidently said that he owned whatever. He didn't own anything of those boys. But I never saw one check from that rise and fall of ECW. Mm. I never saw one penny from it. I don't think that Sabu has or anybody else. But there was his highest rated... I mean, there was the highest selling DVD that he ever put out, I yes, believe. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And now he goes ahead and takes in all of that money because he couldn't produce it himself. It was the guys that produced that. And now he's going to go ahead and produce this pay-per-view, a pretend-to-be pay-per-view called ECW again. Who does this man think he is? Yeah. Yep. Who does he think he is? Yep. And I'll tell you what. I'm not the fondest guy of Shane Douglas, nor am I the fondest guy of the people running that show. But by God, we're a bunch of individuals over there. And we're a bunch of guys that are still that are still around out there. There's still people around out there that uh, uh, you can call them what you want to, nuts, crazies, uh, whatever. But I like to call them pro wrestlers that... Uh, that gummit, they just they're just looking for a a dog on stage to perform on. Yeah. And they need a stage. And by golly, we got one there and we're gonna give you a heck of a lot better show than the others do. Yeah. And and that's tremendous. We're gonna we're gonna try our best. Because by golly we know it has to be. And that's uh Friday night, June tenth at the uh at the ECW at the at the real ECW arena. Thank you. You got it. You got that right. And you know, why don't we wrap up on a on a happier note and um maybe we can talk about some memories of, of a great man, a guy that, that I had the honor of knowing a little bit, and I know you knew him pretty well, Chris Candido who passed away recently. A great guy. Yeah. And the reason I love Chris Candido so much and he's just he's a breath of fresh air every night. Yeah. Chris Candido was, and uh, he'd come into that dressing room no matter what had happened in, all day long or the day before or whatever, and he'd come in there, and boy, he was he was just a wonderful breath of fresh air. It's a great way to to uh, describe him whenever he'd come in there, and gosh, he was a fun guy. Uh, he loved the business probably more than anybody else I know, and he could do a better Terry Funk interview than... <laughs> Are you sure that wasn't Chris, uh, Chris Candido doing those? 
<laughs> I'll bet you money that you better check that out. Uh, I, I should. Check. I think it's Chris Candido. That didn't Terry Funk. Huh? He was even wearing your tights the uh, one night. I remember uh, seeing him wrestle in the ECW <laughs> arena. Yeah, he'd come in and say, "Yo, he'd come into the ring and wrestle." Well, he'd wear them whenever I wasn't around. But finally, he went ahead and wore them in front of me one night. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, gosh darn! I just wish he was still around. Yeah, that's uh, that's really a sad situation, you know. Whenever you you, you get your life straightened out, get everything going right and everything, and you you think you're doing well and have a dad gum injury, and 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 that's what's tough about it is is we have to pay our own bills and everything, you know. And uh, he didn't want to stay in that hospital because he wanted out of there. Yeah. So uh did that and flew back home and threw a blood clot. And uh, Dad coming, it's just a shame. It's a real tragic story and a, and, a, and a great guy that I just, I thought the world of him. And it goes back to something you write about in your book about the possibility of a union and how there should be some kind of union for these guys to dig into for medical expenses at least. There should, and that's not something that should be, uh, uh, you know, I doubt if it'll ever happen. Yeah, but uh, it should happen, and uh, I'm not talking about for myself. But they should get together and uh, uh, bind together and, and and get something at least at least medical. You know, I've seen yeah. too many guys die, and and uh, um, seen too many guys die in this business, and uh, not even be able to pay for for their funeral, much less their medical. Yeah, absolutely. You know? well, and, and it would be easy to do. Uh, you, you break it down in your book, and and uh, and you break it down so simplistically that there really is no reason that it can't be done. No, no, it should be done. Well, well, Terry, uh, listen, what a fast hour this was! It was just an honor having you back. I would love to have you again, and uh, I just want to wish you all the best of luck in the world with the new book. It is fantastic. You can get it at Amazon.com, at fine bookstores anywhere. And again, you are going to be in town here at the Montgomeryville Mall on Saturday, June 11th from 1 to 3 signing books. Terry, thanks again for doing the show. And I want to be sure and tell everybody out there to, like I told you before, mm -hmm. is buy that dadgum book and read it. And if you like it, go ahead and tell somebody else. Maybe they'll buy it. And if you don't like it, Keep your dad gum mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Terry Funk, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only. One of, you know, I have had the honor and the pleasure of meeting a lot of guys in this business. And I tell people all the time that one of my favorites, one of the sweetest guys that I've ever met in this industry has been Terry Funk. And um, to be able to call a match of his, uh, do commentary for his match with Steve Carino in the barbed wire match was just such an honor. And again, you know, when I started in ECW as a ring announcer and I weaseled my way in in the beginning and then kind of got accepted and broken in. And, um, you know, I would just watch guys like Terry Funk and watch uh, how they talk, how they walk, how they act, how they react, the things they say, the things they don't say. And that kind of presence is really lost today on independent wrestling. You know, I've had the opportunity to to be a part of some of these these growing independent companies, and I'll walk in there, and sometimes the promoters will say, what do you think? Or some of the other guys will say, what do you think? And I'll say, you know, I, I think you have a chance, but you're missing a key ingredient. You're missing that Terry Funk, the Terry Funk ingredient, which is the seasoned experienced veteran that's going to go in there selflessly and do whatever or anything that he can to help get the company and the boys and the product over to the best of his abilities and that is a critical component that is missing today in a lot of these um these blossoming independent companies companies that i work for now companies that i have worked for and companies that i see from a distance so again terry funk his autobiography, More Than Just Hardcore, available at fine bookstores everywhere. It's available on Amazon.com. There is a link on my website, ProWrestlingRadio.com, so you can go there directly and just click on it. And if you missed Terry Funk's first appearance back in 2000, that interview as well is on my website. And that's also at ProWrestlingRadio.com. And at the time, he was just finishing up in WCW, so he was real animated about WCW at the time. And it was a lot of fun. Um, he, he, was a little, um, he was a little more angry at that time as compared to today. So that's a good thing. 
Anyway, uh, I want to thank Bill Melody for making things happen on this end of the dial. Following me today will be Chris Ermer and Lou Powers out at the Academy Theater. Bill Melody is back tomorrow from 6 to 10 a.m. A couple of quick show notes in the last minute that I have here. Next Saturday, the 28th of May, Bruno Sammartino is back on the show. One of my favorite guests, without a doubt the most controversial guest in show history. He will be back next Saturday, and I will open up the second half of the show uh, for your calls. You can talk directly to Bruno. Bruno had a great time doing that the first time. We're going to do that again. On June 4th, I will be live on location at Trenton Heritage Days from the Bank of America on West State Street. I have stuff to give away. And I'm also going to have Matt Hardy on the show that day uh, over the phone. So you can come out there if you want to ask Matt a question. Uh, maybe I'll open up the live mic and you can talk directly to Matt. Matt Hardy on the show as well, June 4th. Uh, June the 11th, we're going to have open calls. It'll be the only show in a while that will have an entire show devoted to your calls. And June the 18th, I am back at Summerton Beverages for Summerfest. They have free alcoholic samples, free food, prizes, St. Pauli girls, Bud girls. It is so much fun. We do it every year, and it is such a blast. I'll have stuff to give away myself and uh, that much more. And again, for more information on all of the upcoming shows, or if you missed anything today, including the Terry Funk interview, check out ProWrestlingRadio.com. Well, that will about do it for me. I will see you next Saturday at 12.05 with Bruno Sammartino. Have a great weekend, everybody.